Howdy everyone, welcome back. And yes, before you ask, I did get all of my hairs cut. Thanks for noticing. Anyway, uh, today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at uh, what the physics is going on with this electromagnetic induction stuff. So, just want to summarize a couple of things real quick that hopefully you've already noticed from your own observations using the Gizmo uh, app and also taking a look at the uh, videos that I posted uh, above in the discussion board. Um, again, note that there is this kind of weird duality between electricity and magnetism. Up until this point, what we've seen is we've seen that if you have moving electrical charges uh, or currents that pass through a magnetic field, depending upon uh, the angles and everything, we can use the right hand and the left hand rule to figure out whether or not there's a force acting on those moving charges. And depending upon how you configure things, you can do all kinds of wild stuff, like you can figure out uh, the mass of electrons and protons and other charged particles as they follow circular paths in a magnetic field. Uh, if you have current passing through wires in the magnetic field and you arrange things properly, you can uh, create electrical motors and that has all kinds of wild applications. But there's another side to it, right? So what we're doing is we're kind of flipping the idea around. So before we were talking about the idea of uh, if you have a moving charge through a magnetic field, you get a force. But if you instead uh, use a force to move a wire uh, relative to a magnetic field, or vice versa, you have the magnetic field move relative to the wire, you create a current, right? And that's called electromagnetic induction. And it has all kinds of great applications. Uh, for example, if you, rev if you uh, use a sort of a motor in reverse, you create a generator, right? You generate electrical power. This is how all of our electrical power that runs, you know, our electrical grid, uh, such as the computer that you're watching right now, that's how all of this uh, power is generated is through electromagnetic induction. Uh, and as a quick example of this, I actually have a live demo I can show you here. Uh, some of you may have seen these kinds of flashlights before. Okay, now I'll get this a little closer so that you can see. Um, this is a flashlight that works and uh, that without batteries. There's no batteries in this, right? What there is, is if you look carefully here, you can see there's a coil of wire right there. Let me get that really close so you can see all of those, you know, all those loops of wire right there in that coil. And right here, we have a magnet, and I can prove to you that that's a magnet because I have a paper clip here. And if I put the paper clip right there, see, it sticks to the magnet, right? And if I let the magnet slide along, oops, the paper clip slides along with it, right? So what you've got there is you've got a coil of wire and a magnet, okay? And the way that this thing works, uh, based upon electromagnetic conduction, if I shake this back and forth like this, right, if I do this, you can see the magnet passes back and forth through the coil. And the wires connected to the coil go over here to a capacitor, and a current that is generated here, a current that's induced in this coil when the magnet passes back and forth through it, um, that current is driven over here into the capacitor, it charges up the capacitor, and then the capacitor can act like a temporary battery. And I can prove that to you because if I turn it this way, so that you can see the LED here, and I turn this thing on, it's turned on now, but there's no light, right? Because there's no energy flowing from the coil due to electromagnetic interduction electromagnetic induction, right? And if I wiggle it back and forth like this, see the light shines temporarily, right? Okay, so right there, that's a pr very practical application of electromagnetic induction. And the idea is if I, you know, shake this thing back and forth a whole bunch for like a minute or two, then what will happen is the capacitor will charge up and it'll run continuously without me having to move Around. So that's a really cool application and demonstration of electromagnetic conduction. And I'm sure you guys have seen this before. You may even have one in your own house in an emergency kit. Okay, so very useful. So having said that, let's get to the main question of what we're talking about today. What the physics is going on? How does this work? Now there's a variety of ways of thinking about it, and you may have seen in some of the videos above that they talk about stuff like Faraday's Law, they talk about fluxes and all this sort of thing. We'll get into that later, but what I want to do is I really want to take a look at some things that you've learned recently and apply them to this idea. So let's imagine the following scenario. Okay, I want you to imagine uh, that you have a metallic bar, uh, 
uh, you know, oriented horizontally like this. And imagine that this metallic bar is falling downwards, and uh, it's falling downwards like this. And as it does so, it falls through a magnetic field. I'm going to draw this out on the board. Okay, so let's suppose here is our metal bar. Oops, let me use a different uh, pen. Okay, here's our metal bar right here. And let's suppose the metal bar is falling straight down like this. And we're going to assume it stays horizontally like that. Okay, and so it's falling with a velocity v like so. And let's suppose that this entire region here is filled up with a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is going into the screen. Uh, away from you, right? And so remember that is indicated by a circle with an X. Okay, so we've got our magnetic field here. And remember the symbol that we use to represent magnetic field is a capital B vector. Okay, so that's the situation. Now, let's assume that we're talking about an electron inside of this metal bar. Now, when the metal bar falls, right, when the metal bar drops, it's not like the metal bar drops and then leaves a cloud of electrons behind, right? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so when you drop this metal bar like this, the electrons obviously move down with it. So if we think about an electron here, it's representing a little, a little electron. That electron is now moving downwards through a magnetic field, which is going into the board like this. Now, here's the question. Can you figure out what's going to happen to this electron? Okay, I'll give you a few seconds. You can pause the video. Okay, you got it? All right, here. Here's the answer. You have to use your left-hand rule, right? Left because this is a negative charge. You have to use your left-hand rule to figure out that there's going to be a force acting on this electron. Now, let's do that really quick, okay? The electron is moving with the bar downwards, so you've got to take your thumb over your left hand and stick it that way. Remember, your fingers represent the magnetic field, so your fingers have to point in this way. Okay, so we have to twist our hand like so. Okay, and which way does your palm face? Palm faces in this direction. Okay, so what ends up happening is there is a force which pushes on the electron in this direction. Put a little F there for force. And so what's the result of this? The result is that the electrons in the bar, as long as the bar is falling through the magnetic field, the electrons in the bar are pushed in this direction. So the bar polarizes electrically. So what will happen is, as long as the bar is moving, this end of the bar will become negatively charged. And of course, all of the electrons were driven in this direction, so that leaves behind over here a whole bunch of positive charge. So you have this electrically polarized metallic bar. Now, the thing that's really cool about this is this is something that happens with all conducting materials when they pass through a magnetic field, just to varying degrees. Like, for example, um, an airplane, right? Uh, you may have... Uh, heard that, you know, airplanes get hit by lightning pretty often. That's why there has to be a Faraday cage built into the structure of the airplane to protect everybody and the electronics and stuff inside. Well, on average, your average uh, airplane uh, gets hit uh, by lightning. And when I say airplane, I mean like commercial airliner, uh, gets hit by lightning probably two or three times a year. One of the reasons why they get hit by lightning so often is because of this, right? Because the, the body of the airplane is made of metal. And then the airplane is flying along. And what's it doing? It's flying through the Earth's magnetic field. So when this airplane flies through the Earth's magnetic field, uh, it polarizes electrically in this manner, for the reasons we mentioned. And if and I think if you think about this, if you, if you imagine one wing tip of the airplane is negatively charged while the opposite wing tip is positively charged, uh, can you see how that would uh, create a lightning strike? Okay, so there you go. Now, this is the first step, right? We still haven't figured out what's going on with current flow, right? Like, like what you saw with the flashlight and in the other examples in the other videos. How does this lead to a current flow? Well, let's 
let's kind of revisit the following bar, right? In reality, if you drop this bar, it would probably wobble like that as it fell. So let's make sure it doesn't wobble like this as it falls. We want it to fall nice and smooth, right? So the bar stays parallel to the ground as it falls. So let's suppose what we do is we, to ensure that it falls in that manner, let's suppose that what we do is we, we add on a couple of rails here, right? So we put, we put a couple of little connectors on each end of the bar, like, you know, right here and right over here. And then we have a couple of little metallic rails that go like this and they go like this. And then what we do is at the bottom here, we connect these two rails together like so. Okay, now this is uh, a very important development because what we see here is we see we have now have a loop, a conducting loop, okay, or a closed circuit, a closed electrical circuit. And uh, so let's think about this now, right? So the bar is falling through this magnetic field. Uh, the, the resulting force from the left-hand rule uh, pushes the electrons in the bar this way. The bar polarizes. Now you get a big pile of electrons right here, but these electrons don't want to be here. Where do the electrons want to be? Well, they want to be back over here where the positive charges are, right? That's where the party is. But can these electrons move this way through the bar to get over there? Well, no, because there's a force pushing this way. Remember, as long as this bar is moving down, this force is going to shove electrons over here. So if the electrons want to be where the positive charges are, but they can't go this way, what's their only option? See if you can get it. Right. They have to go all the way around like this. And so what you end up getting is you get this moving all the way around the entire circuit to get back where these positive charges are. But the moment they get over there, as long as the bar is moving, this force pushes them again and they just keep going and circulating around and around and around. And what do you have there, folks, when you have electrons moving around continuously in a loop like this? Ladies and gentlemen, this is what's called an induced current. Okay? So that is your induced current. Now, for the purposes of AP physics, it's important to understand that, uh, of course, in reality, what we're talking about is we're talking about electrons flowing around in this sort of counterclockwise direction in this example. But for AP physics, you know, everything's done in terms of conventional current, right? So in reality, for like purposes of the AP test, what we would say is we would say there is a positive conventional current, a little plus sign on there to remind us, going in this direction. Okay. Not quite the end of the story though. There's something else that's really, really cool that happens here. And so what I want you to do is I want you to take a moment to look up here at the bar very carefully. And I want you to see, and again, you can pause the video on this before I give the answer. I want you to see if you can think about going one more step with what you what we've learned here and see if you can see what else might happen up here to this bar. Okay, take a, take a pause uh, on the video and see if you can figure it out. All right, we're back. What happens? Well, let's go up and look at the bar. Now for this, because I've drawn in electrons moving this way or a positive, a positive conventional current going that way, you can use either the right hand or the left hand for this. Okay, it doesn't matter which one, I'll do both. Um, if we think about the left hand for uh, electrons, uh, the, the electrons are moving in this direction. Okay, you have a sustained electron flow going going in this direction through the metal bar inside of a magnetic field. So take your left hand, stick your thumb in this direction, stick your fingers into the board, and which way, this is a little tricky, which way does your palm face? Your palm faces up. You can do this with the right hand as well for the positive conventional current. Positive conventional current goes that way. Your fingers are the magnetic field, they go in, and again, the palm faces up. So there's a force that acts on the metal bar going which way? Upwards. And we call that a magnetic braking force. And the reason why it's called a braking force is because that force 
is in the opposite direction from the velocity of the bar. So you have this upward force here. Called F sub B. That is a braking force. It's called braking because it acts like, well, brakes on a car, right? What it's going to do is it's going to act in the opposite direction from the velocity, and that's going to serve to slow the bar down, right? So what's going to happen is, as the bar falls, it's going to slow down. So you've got all these wild things happening, right? You've got, you've got the induced current in the first place, but then that current interacting with the magnetic field, which generated the current in the first place, interacts again, and you get this braking force. Now, after this video, right, if you continue looking down through the discussion board post, you'll see there's a whole bunch of other videos that I want you to watch that show you a lot of really wild examples of this magnetic braking. Uh, and there are some interesting applications of that, too. And then there's another video at the end, uh, a little something to make you go, hmm, which seems to completely contradict all of this, but it ends up it doesn't contradict it because there's something else we haven't talked to, or we haven't talked about yet in terms of what's going on here. There's this underlying idea behind all of this, and that's called magnetic flux. And we'll get to that at a later time. Hope that helps. You guys take care, stay safe, go team physics.